Hello to everyone and welcome to everyone joining our webinar, which is on our graduate opportunities in data and technology, um, which we focus in mainly on how to become a cloud engineer. So just to begin with, I'll just give a little bit of background about Kubrick. So we exist to help tackle the digital skills crisis. And we do this by paying graduates and junior professionals with no relevant skills or experience in data, AI or technology to train before assigning them to a leading client while they'll work on real projects for two years. So just a little bit more then, um, we've supported now nearly 100 organisations across industries um, to overcome the growing skills gap and change the lives of over 600 graduates and young professionals. So in doing so then, we have become recognised as the second fastest growing company in the UK by the 2020 Sunday Times Virgin Atlantic Fast Track 100. So our training is designed and delivered by industry leaders who have developed our specialisms in data engineering, data management, machine learning engineering and data product consultancy, as well as cloud engineering um, to anticipate the needs of the modern workforce. So in a rapid, rapidly changing world, clients choose Kubrick to augment their teams with high quality skills and talent champion diversity and future proof their capabilities. So today then, obviously our webinar will focus on understanding what is involved with our cloud engineering practice. And this will incorporate what cloud engineering is, why it's important for businesses and what you'll cover in our training program, as well as what the role will involve. Um, so just a couple of things then, just to make you aware, we do have two recruiters at hand throughout the webinar to answer any recruiter related questions. So throughout, like I said, if you have any questions related to the recruitment process, just pop them in the chat and they'll answer them for you. And just to then please save any other questions um, for our panelists until the end, as there will be some time for some questions then. So with all that out of the way, um, without further ado, I'd like to ask um, each of, the, of our panellists, sorry, to introduce themselves. So if it's okay, we'll start with you first, Richard. Hello, everyone. Great to be here. My name is Richard Pears. Uh, I'm the CTO here at Kubrick Group. Uh, I've held uh, multiple uh, CIO and CTO roles. So I guess I'm here to hopefully give you more insight as to why cloud engineering capabilities are in such high demand uh, by businesses globally and therefore why it's a great career to get into. That's great. Thank you for that, Richard. And then Martin. So hello there. My name is Martin Palmer. I'm head of cloud engineering here with Kubrick. Um, I'm a developer that kind of went through the ranks, graduated 25 years ago with a maths and IT degree and have experienced all kinds of different systems along the way. And all of that's been feeding into what leads into cloud engineering. So a lot of the experience and a lot of the patterns I've picked up along the way, the good and the bad, feeds very much into what we put into cloud engineering. And more of that a bit later. <laughs> but, and also the purpose of where that fits in. So how it's structured to fit what the industry is looking for um, to make sure you're very, very relevant to uh, today's needs. That's great. Thank you, Martin. And then we have Misa. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Misa Talabawi. Um, I'm currently training in the cloud engineering program. We're on week eight of 15. Um, my background is in civil engineering. So I studied that at university. I went into um, that role for a bit, but I kind of wanted to change into a new kind of career, which I know is gonna be advancing um, at a crazy rate. And uh, I'm gonna talk about why I chose Kubrick and how Kubrick can help people that don't have um, the experience in this field and a bit about the training so far as well. Thank you, Misa. And then finally, we have Jonathan. Hi, I'm John. Um, I did my Kubrick training uh, last summer. Um, so I did a biology degree. I uh, didn't have any experience in cloud at all. Uh, did all the training for three months. And then I've been on client site for 11 months. Uh, work in the media industry um, and uh, we're helping to build a, a streaming service platform and hopefully I can talk about what cloud engineering work is like uh, day to day. That's great thank you for that John so just to break down then the talk then so firstly um, just to ask Richard a couple of questions then a bit more about you and um, so it's okay if you can just tell us a bit more about what cloud engineering is and why it's critical to so many businesses. Sure. 
I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, firstly, uh, let's have a bit of a crack at describing what the cloud is. Uh, so in very simple terms, because there are uh, you know hundreds of definitions out there, uh, cloud enables businesses to rent computing power. Um, many years ago, I'm sure when uh, myself and Martin started, businesses had to work this out for themselves, had to build uh, server rooms and order computers and put it all together. But now we can rent all of that computing power. Uh, the likes of Amazon, Microsoft, Google, and many others have built these huge data centers. So they're uh, effectively uh, big factories containing uh, hundreds and thousands of uh, computers, all of the necessary electricity into those data centers, all of the necessary air conditioning to keep the computers running uh, and, and not getting too hot, all of the wiring and uh, fiber cabling to connect all of that computing power uh, to the internet. Uh, and then on top of that, um, and uh, Amazon was first uh, to market with uh, really this infrastructure uh, kind of cloud service. Um, leveraging their retail e-commerce experience, um, they effectively created a cloud e-commerce experience. So you didn't have to go to that huge warehouse and say, I want 10 of those computers and or 100 of those over here. Uh, you could literally go to a website and say, I want that, 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 that. Uh, and then all of a sudden, um, you know, as a business, you have all of that computing power as much as you need uh, within a couple of seconds. And really, all of that is looked after for you, for you so you can concentrate on what's important to your business, uh, which is largely speaking in the digital world that we live in today is how we create, deploy, and then run software. So all of our attention now as a business can be focused on that. And within a second, we can scale up, scale down um, based on our demand and our needs, um, exactly what we need. And obviously we pay uh, for as much as we use. If we turn it off, we no longer pay. And there's some significant cost optimizations into doing that, as well as the scalability benefits, as well as letting businesses really focus on what they need to focus on to drive their business growth. Um, and that's where cloud engineering becomes incredibly uh, important. So cloud engineers, um, working very closely with data and or software engineers, really make it possible uh, for businesses to create and deploy their software faster on the cloud, clearly, and therefore leveraging all of the cloud benefits around scalability, up, down as needed, only pay for what you need, um, multiple kind of resilience capabilities so that you can keep your software or data products available at all times, uh, regardless of the time of day, regardless of uh, the demand and how many customers are visiting uh, your products. So cloud engineers make that all possible um, in terms of making uh, software uh, creation and deployment quicker. There is lots of automation of how you deploy uh, the software into those uh, uh, production uh, level products. There's lots of architectural elements of how we structure that software code so that we can uh, work on smaller pieces of code, maybe uh, microservices, and we'll likely talk a bit about that. Um, so that people and developers can work in parallel uh, and deliver and create software faster, as well as automate the deployment and the quality checks um, before that becomes available uh, to the business's customers. So if we you know, understand what that uh, cloud capability is and understand that every business is either fully in the cloud here at Kubrick, Kubrick Group, we're 100% in the cloud. I was in my last business um, and those that aren't, 100% uh, in the cloud are uh, fast accelerating and migrating quickly to the cloud to leverage uh, all of those businesses. I think we all know the uh, level of digital transformation across all global businesses right now and uh, how every business is in a fast race to uh, deliver quality products um, to, to their customer base and time to market uh, is really important. And then because they're digitizing all of their business critical services, the business critical availability and resilience and security aspects, regardless of peak demands, let's say Black Friday demands on a retail uh, website go through the roof for you know, at least two weeks around that time, the number of computing power in the cloud that you need to auto scale to make sure that your website still runs and you can still sell all of your uh, products is significantly different to two weeks, let's say prior to 
uh, Black Friday in that example, where you're spending a lot less because you're only leveraging, you know, 10 computers, not 100 computers in those huge uh, data centers uh, provided uh, by those cloud providers. So I guess in summary, all CTOs, CIOs, CDOs, CEOs are investing uh, huge amounts of money in trying to deliver quality uh, digital services through software. They all want to go faster and they all want those uh, software and data products to be highly resilient, available, performant uh, and secure because they're becoming an ever increasing um, importance to their overall business and growth. And as cloud engineers, you will help them go faster and you will protect their business critical uh, digital services from failing or being attacked. So it's a crucial role uh, for every business going forward and will be uh, for many years uh, and decades to come. Now, thank you for that, um, Richard. And then just with that as well, um, are there any drivers that increase the need for cloud engineering capabilities for specific, specific businesses? Yeah, I think, you know, there's there's multiple top level drivers. Every, every business wants to increase revenue. Uh, every business wants to reduce costs where it can. Uh, every business wants to re reduce risks. And I think I've spoken to some about, you know, increasing revenue through digitization of services and being fast to, first to market and going, uh, you know, quicker and smarter against competitors uh, in the digital world that we now live uh, is a key driver. So if you're really trying to launch new products and services and, uh, you know, own that market quicker than anyone else can compete. You need to go faster. And that's a, a real driver for architecting how your all of your engineers work together uh, so they can do things in parallel or automate things quicker so that they can deliver those changes quicker. Um, and also from a risk perspective, um, you know, prior to digitizing services, there was less dependency on, uh, you know, websites or mobile apps or any kind of digital mechanisms by which customers interact with businesses uh, were, uh, you know, are increasingly more important. If they go down, then you suddenly lose lot, a much higher proportion of your uh, revenue uh, in today's world. So, you know, increasingly risk governance in businesses drives increased availability, resilience and security uh, agendas. And then uh, finally, uh, if you're looking to reduce costs and only pay for that huge computing power as and when you need it and spin up new kind of non-production environments if you want to test things out and then close them down when you're ready to go uh, into a production product, uh, then you can leverage all of that cost uh, optimization that the cloud uh, elasticity uh, provides for you. So they're the main kind of business drivers. I, I, I guess a fourth one, uh, not at that top level, is some businesses are still migrating to the cloud. And therefore, when you're doing big migrations from non-cloud environments to cloud, uh, that's a kind of fourth overall driver um, that will kind of drive up demand in cloud engineering. Now, thank you for that, Richard. And then Kind of with what Richard said, um, leading on from that, Martin, um, just to ask you a couple of questions here. What would you say are the key areas that um, trainees will learn during the 15 weeks um, continuing training program and sort of how um, that has been designed to sort of based on your experience and to sort of meet the business demand? Um, sort of about what Richard's just spoken about. Okay, so um, prereqs coming into cloud engineering is not saying you've got any experience of any programming language before or whether you actually have been building various bits in a cloud. What we're looking at the prereqs coming in is the ability to look at problems, a desire for levels of automation. If I can make things repeatable, then I can get on with the other stuff I want to do. So we're starting off with those various pieces. So. From my background, I said I've done various safety critical, mission critical, loss of life, environment systems. A lot of it is making sure that things are repeatable. Even pre-cloud, you want to make sure that it worked, that things were working properly. That means that actually, when you're using it, the behavior is exactly as you expect it to be. If it's not, as Richard was saying, people stop using those services. You move on to other things. So we're starting from the very, very basics. We're letting you kind of get used to how to work with some of the tools. So we want to make, as from an engineering point of view, we're looking at source code control. We want to make sure that you can work with a shared 
copy of what's happening with the uh, material you're working on. And we're getting you used to doing the collaboration with those pieces as well. So if you've used some of those tools in the past, we're encouraging the collaboration, just like you'd have in a business environment. Everything we're trying to drive in here is very much on getting you experience ready to go into the business, whichever business you're going along into. We're going to be looking at getting that tooling, getting you familiar with how you can start to manually configure bits with different clouds. So we are looking at all three clouds along the way. So Microsoft is your um, Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud Platform. We're getting you familiar with using some of the tooling in there, how you can make things, and in the training space, how you can comfortably break things and learn from those pieces along the way. Because it's just as useful to have the negative experience of that went wrong, I can see what the error result is, as well as seeing it always work perfectly every time. So from that bit, you'll start to look at the problem solving to build up going through. We start to build up those various pieces. We can now look at more collaborative pieces of work going through. So we started to build up some experience around programming languages. One of the key things in Kubrick, we learn a lot about Python. So we use that to build up experience of using that language and we're applying it to cloud. We're starting off with very simple things and gradually we're building on each of them every single time, a layer upon layer upon layer to give you a good foundation on how I can program, how I can work collaboratively, how I can start to build up these various pieces by hand. And then we look at the evolution of that bit into automation. We take advantage of some of the tools that are out there, which will allow us to automatically generate a shared copy, a similar copy of the thing that's out there, another environment in exactly the same configuration with all the right security pieces, all of the right permissions, all set up by default. If we can make it repeatable, we know that actually that, that bit's working perfectly every single time. That's one of the key things that clients are looking for is that repeatability. A lot of things where it goes wrong in, in client environments is where people make changes with lots of good intentions, but they never got round to quite getting the same change applied to other pieces. As we're going through those pieces, we'll pick up various different techno technology and terminology. So we'll pick up various pieces of containerization, how we can group various pieces together so we can make things easier to pass around and we know it's always the same shape. Again, how we can apply those pieces into this multi-cloud space. So by the time you've finished, you've been able to take any this piece of code, solve various problems with it, know it's testable, run various languages with it, so that actually those entities that you can make, yeah, you can guarantee that they're working in the right place in the right way. We have also, as part of it going through, we have a, a two week project, client project that we're working with. So the client comes up with a specification and we apply what we've been learning in cloud engineering to those particular topics. So we will give a, a bespoke solution. It might be a proof of concept to help us take advantage of our learnings, but also stretch us slightly because the client requirements will be something different from what we've been doing in training because our training is, a give, your training is giving you a good foundation, but it's not gonna get you ready for every single scenario out there because the clients will give you very specific scenarios. That final two week project is brilliant for giving that extra exposure of what clients are looking for and their specific requirements and how you can tailor your, how you're working and what you've made to those specific client requirements. Yeah, that sounds great, Martin. And then kind of leading on from that then, how do you make the right balance then between what, the, what most versus what more like some specific clients want rather than what, I can't remember my words out with that kind of, but do you know okay. what I mean? With the right balance between those two? Absolutely. So something that's very important out there, there was a state of DevOps report that came out last year that reinforced this, this same point. There's lots of people that know bits of technology, but actually there aren't necessarily the soft skills to go with it. The businesses out there are not just looking for people who can understand technology, but actually relate it to what the client is looking for. Have the conversations with the architecture team, with the security team, understand what's needed with your data scientists if you're working in that space. So you're giving the right configuration, the right shape for those pieces in there. And as Richard was saying, not everybody is, uh, you know, we're all in the cloud. You're all on some part of that journey as you're going through. How can you help them along that journey? And that's one of the skills that we're trying to encourage a lot along the way is the collaboration, the communication, how you can relate what you've been working on there 
So actually it's applicable to what the client is looking for because that's exactly what they want. If all the problems have been solved, there will be no need for consultants. We are providing consultants. We're helping you solve the problems. We might not have the answers yet, but we can work with you on those various pieces and build it up from our own experience or refer back into Kubrick if need be to go and say, does somebody know about these various pieces um, to take advantage of that um, shared knowledge to actually build up you know, the right solution for the client as needed at that time. So, yeah, I mean, leading on from kind of what you're saying, Martin, I know, Misa, you're dealing with the training firsthand at the moment. So just kind of from your perspective, um, what was it kind of that attracted you to Kubrick's cloud engineering program? Um, I think for me, I knew that um, I wanted to go into data and really be on um, kind of the forefront of this development and technology. Uh, cloud is not something that is relatively um, old, it's quite new, it's quite an advancement in tech and Kubrick's extensive training is, I took it as kind of like a, an academic opportunity to take this you know, three months of really, a really great experience of learning everything. I had no um, programming experience, I didn't know any of the programming languages even, I, I think we touched on maybe MATLAB at university but I didn't have kind of the fundamentals of um, data. So being able to join a company that can guide you in that and really like have that um, extensive experience from the trainers. And it's an environment where um, they always say, you know, there's no silly questions. It's a place where you get to be kind of comfortable with your group and like everyone's helping each other. It's, it's, there's a lot of people that studied computer science and some people that haven't. And then we're sharing different kinds of skills like some people have better soft skills and like kind of can help with presentations. It's it's kind of like a community in a way. It's everyone's trying to help each other. The trainers are really, really helpful. Um, I, I definitely wanted to um, be in a tech role and I don't think I would have been able to get um, that quick of a, a kind of, it was, it was a quick learning curve in a way. Like it's a lot of new content to learn quickly, but with, with the training, I think it's been really, um, helpful of you know once I join client site I can know that I you know I have these core skills that I can um use uh, on site I know that's great I mean Martin you may want to cover your years I'm just going to ask me to now how are you sort of finding the training yeah. so far and what have you learned yeah so it's it's definitely not easy if you're um it's new and nothing new is easy you can't really grow in your comfort that's kind of one of my quotes obviously you have to be willing to put your full energy into wanting to learn something new if you don't have this experience. I don't think it's something to be scared of if you have STEM background and you are able to solve problems, you're able to think analytically, you're able to break problems down into like a logical way. It's not something that is, you know, as scary as I probably initially thought. Um, it's been really good, to be honest. Like I, I've covered Python now and that that is a language now that I know. I've, we've done SQL, a database uh, language. Um, so that's two new, completely new programs that I'm able to work on and solve uh, problems with. As well as that, we're doing, as Martin said, a lot of stuff of um, the cloud infrastructure. Infrastructure. So the top three that um, we're using is Azure, which is Microsoft's one, AWS, which is the Amazon one, and then a Google Cloud Provider, which is Google. And each of them, um, we're using the programming skills we learned with Python to create specific functions that are used to output specific results. That's basically how we're putting all the pieces of our training together. We're learning the core skills. We're able to see what is the um, servers or applications to put these, I guess, problem solving uh, codes within it. Um, I'm finding it really good. I mean, like I said, it's a collaborative experience with the training. The trainers are more than happy to help you when you feel stuck or you know if you need spe uh, specific help with something and even again your your colleagues as well that's also an environment that is is really um, open and receptive to questions and helping each other that's something that made the training definitely a lot easier oh, that sounds great and then obviously looking ahead now what are you most sort of looking forward to in the weeks ahead uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to, as Martin was saying, the client project. I think that gives us an opportunity to apply all the skills that we've kind of developed in the last 15 weeks, um, as well as um, continuing kind of what we're doing. So we just 
kind of got started by, I guess, at this kind of halfway mark. I don't know if I'd be right to say this, Martin, we developed most of the kind of behind the scenes, learning everything, getting the core skills, and now it's all about implementing this to specific case studies, examples, creating websites, um, you, putting the pieces together of this puzzle of, new, of something really new. Um, so I guess more practice along with using um, AWS, Azure, and yeah, just getting used to like using these commands over and over again, it's quite a repetitive process. And it's not something that um, I expected it to be quite repetitive in that way. I thought it would all be very, very new and everything would be really different each time, but it's it starts to kind of come together and you see like, you know, everything is, is gonna be implemented in a kind of a sequence and even along with different servers like Google and um, AWS Azure, they're all using the same kind of key points to make a function or to deploy certain tasks. So I feel like, yeah, now it's just about practicing it and keep implementing it and then hopefully it become more second nature to me. And then, yeah, I'm excited for the client project and to kind of go to client site and feel like I've got a lot of knowledge and experience that I can, I can hopefully add to an industry. Uh, thank you for that, Misa. And I think, you know, now also we've got John on the call here. He might be a bit more insightful for you even as well, because I know obviously, John, you've been through the training. Um, so from your perspective sort of then, um, what cloud engineering projects have you been involved in for the business um, you are working on, you're working at now? Like what sort of projects um, are you doing? Yeah, so um, as I said before, um, I work in the media industry and we create a streaming service. And I'd say cloud engineering is probably um, building out those like fundamental, um, like the foundation of how you'd actually deploy like a uh, application or a website. It's, it's, the, it's the compute power, it's, the, it's kind of the basis of um, how you're gonna get people to be able to access uh, whatever you want to uh, show them. Um, and also uh, working at a very large company, um, I think I didn't quite understand the, uh, quite how complex it can be. So um, you might think uh, a simple website, how complicated can it be? But then you, you might have uh, a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. So you'll have all the databases set up. You'll be having uh, a lot of logic running. Um, so it might be that you click on a button and a different thing happens for different people. Uh, a lot, a lot of uh, what's being worked on at the moment is uh, uh, having a um, being able to log in to websites so that people can uh, have it, have personalized data. So you can have like machine learning going on behind the scenes, uh, things like that. And it, it, there's so many different uh, technologies that interact with each other. And the the idea with cloud engineering is to kind of weave these together and and provide a platform. Uh, to run it. So let's say you, your developers have written your code. Uh, you want to know how to actually run it on a server and get it out there. How do you, how do you connect it to the internet? All, all of these, all of these basic things. So that's really what I'm, I'm spending most of my time on. Um, so it's probably easier to go through some like, explanations, I guess. Um, so one of the one of the examples would be kind of scalability uh, is what we work on a lot. Um, so the idea is that during the day, you might have loads of people accessing your website, um, but then at nighttime, very, very few. And you don't want to be paying for your application to be running in the day and at the night. So what we do is we can build up a cluster for your application to run on. And that can kind of like scale uh, over, over different time periods. And then you've also got linked into that all the monitoring around that. So you can then uh, create dashboards. You can see how it's working. You can see if anything's breaking. And that, that's, that's the kind of idea about scalability. And it's, it's not really just scalability in applications. It's also databases. So you might think of a data engineer. Um, they, would, they would probably be uh, manipulating data quite a lot. So they might be writing code to like adjust data, to merge sections together, to, to really bring out insights. But as a cloud engineer, you'll be working on like the lower level of like how much compute power do you need? How fast does it need to be? Uh, how, which, which technology is best to use? Because there's, there's a range and the best, the best cloud engineers can really offer um, good advice on, on what, what, what to do. Um, and then I suppose another area that I work on quite a lot is programming. So uh, a kind of saying is to almost automate yourself out of a job. There's so much work to do that 
if you have a like a mundane task that you don't really uh, enjoy that much, you can you can automate it completely. Uh, so let's say you have an Excel spreadsheet um, that you're having to grab some data on. You can just write a, a script and you can just uh, automate all of these tasks. So a lot of programming is involved. And I suppose uh, also monitoring, I briefly mentioned, but um, there's a lot of uh, dashboarding. So you can uh, create um, dashboards to look at how your system's running, uh, see if anything's broken. Uh, it's quite impressive actually when you've got a massive system running and you just glance at a dash dashboard and see the general like health of how your how your application is working. So I'd say overall it's extremely varied and for me at least uh, I'd say no two days are the same. So you might be programming one day, you might be uh, writing queries for a database for a dashboard, uh, you might be um, dealing with very specific technologies so you might be dealing with containerization the idea of your application not just being an application you actually uh shipping your application as a part of really the operating system um so that there's there's a lot of different technologies and it's it's, it's pretty varied yeah, so with all that then how would you sort of say that the training at kubrick um, upskills your, you know, effectively to be able to deliver value to the business that you're currently working with. Yeah, so I'd say what's already really been mentioned is that the the training gives you that really nice foundational level. So all of these all these technologies. So I mentioned uh, programming. So Python is really focused on in the training. You get a you get a good amount of knowledge. You can you can turn up from day one. I I didn't know any Python at all, but by the end I was happily uh, writing scripts all the time. Um, and then also uh, database querying, um, even though we're not technically data engineers, the, the idea is that a cloud engineer will often roll over all of these different technologies. So you still you still need to be able to understand how to query databases. Um, and then then there's the cloud specific technologies. So um, gone are the days of clicking in a website to create a server. Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to create code that's going to have a very specific um, set up you're going to build and then the idea is is that once you've once you've put in the hard work of building that code working out what environment you want uh, you can then just click one button all of it gets produced and let's say something goes wrong you can just then press one button again and you go back to the state that you're in before and this is uh, it's these very basic um, technologies containerization as I already mentioned um, that you just build on over time um, and, and you learn, you just keep on learning uh, when you're on the job. Yeah, that's great. And then sort of lastly, just leading on from that, where do you sort of see your cloud engineering career um, progressing to over the next couple of years? Yeah, so um, the demand is actually pretty terrifying. Um, I think uh, I'd probably say that we're in like almost like a second wave of uh, cloud engineering. So it's this whole idea that everybody would have to have their own server building uh, to run everything that they wanted to run. Uh, and now what we're doing is that initially there were a few probably large companies that maybe tested the waters a bit with cloud engineering, didn't really go fully um, in, didn't really, didn't really, uh, didn't really um, fully uh, commit to it. And now, now what you're saying is people just fully embracing cloud engineering. Um, you're having very small companies just start with cloud engineering startups. Will they? They won't have a data center. They'll just begin with cloud engineering. And this knowledge is is not not many people understand how to do it. You have very senior engineers who are now having to learn cloud engineering. Um, they're probably being paid too much to to basically uh, learn for the beginning how to how to do this. So with these skills, you are in pretty incredible demand at the moment. Um, so yeah, I, I think moving on, it will be building on all the skills that I've learned. At the moment, I, I, I'm good at a few areas. Um, I'm not brilliant at everything. Um, but yeah, just be building on the technologies that I use at the moment. Uh, thank you for that, John. Um, I think that's given everyone a lot more insight into a bit more about cloud engineering. Um, so for just now, just like to see if anyone in the audience has any questions at all. Um, I know I had one through um, that just asked um, which cloud does Kubrick use? So I'm not sure if uh, Martin and Richard might be the best ones to answer that one. 
yeah, I, I think Martin already did it. So we, we do cover uh, the three big ones, uh, which is Amazon Web Services, um, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud. Thank you for that, Richard. And then leading on from that, does anyone else at all have any questions? Hi, thank you for the opportunity. Um, so my question will be, uh, what, how does your training, like, is your training based on on-site, inside or is going to be everything online and you do the placement um, with the client going there on site or you do that everything online? Oh, it's a bit of a blend to be honest. Um, we take advantage of the fact that we've got, uh, we want to build up that community as Misa was saying that community that you're building up within the cloud engineering group, uh, the pizza teams or, or pods as we refer to them. So we want to build up that uh, familiarity with each other as you're going through the various different challenges so that you are not alone very important statement to say you want to make sure that you give aware of collaborative communities so we do have uh, a number of uh, weeks that we're actually in the office working together other points are also working fully remote oh okay thank you for the answer thank you, thank you for the question and then I've got a couple in the chat here. So I have one, um, is cloud engineering and data engineering interlinked? If one is unsure which pathway to take, um, can they start with one and build and then be skilled in both pathways, pathways sorry, as they are quite similar in terms of the skill set? And then why is there so much demand for data engineered compared to cloud in terms of jobs? That's quite a long question there, if we want to break that down. So, similarities yeah with absolutely. Um, i'm going to say there were similarities on the way but actually there's important ones um a client that i was working with before before coming across to kubrick we were dealing with infrastructure as well as big data science very you know, we were looking at terabytes of data being processed daily going through and there isn't i suppose from a technology point of view an exclusion that says i am just a data engineer or i am just a cloud engineer what you're doing is you're working on those various pieces you might have specializations but your skill set makes has an impact upon those that you're working with so in those bits i might have some really good thought leaders working for data science parts of it we were supposed supporting the various bits of infrastructure to go with it but actually it was a conversation oh we need one of these oh i can help you with this bit i know about these pieces so there's a lot of collaboration you can do in those environments and they're definitely not isolation um and i think it's i suppose what's your focus of what you think you're looking at to, to be going into as jonathan was saying there is a lot of demand for cloud engineering out there and we are making sure that as you go through your understanding programming languages so you can work with software engineers and you can work with different applications you can work with data engineers because you're looking at sql and no sql databases as well as some of the tooling to support those various pieces so you're getting a, a nice broad skill set which can then be applicable to your various clients and again as jonathan was saying you can't guarantee what the client's going to want on a different day so actually a varied skill set allows you to become fit in to what the client's needing and what's the applicable bits to go into there and the only thing i would add on the demand question is um I think cloud engineering has been it has become its own dedicated discipline. If you are a data engineer or software engineer, um, you know historically you may have had to do some of the skill sets that a cloud engineer now owns. Uh, but given the size, complexity, functionality, rich features, uh, you know huge customer demand, cloud engineering has become a hugely important uh, role within its own right. So. Um, I think it may look on the surface as though cloud engineering is lower demand than data engineering, but I think if you look under the hood, the skill sets that uh, are more predominantly on the cloud engineering side, I think are more prevalent, more in demand, and certainly as a CTO, um, I was always, um, uh, you know, most struggling to find cloud engineers than I was uh, data engineers or software engineers. So I, I think, you know, there's a level of devil in the detail. Uh, with regards to that, um, but it's certainly, uh, as John said, it's in huge demand, uh, cloud engineering skills right now. And then I think this question is kind of leading on um, 
between the similarities and differences again. Um, someone's asked what is the difference between cloud engineering and machine learning engineering? So um, the cloud engineering, you're getting a much more coverage around, um, I suppose, kind of end-to-end -end business. So that interfacing with those various pieces, you could easily be working with machine learning as well. But it's getting all of that big, the foundations of all the various pieces around it going through and not the specific specialization. Yes, you can be doing machine learning in the cloud. You can be doing data engineering in the cloud. Is that just making sure you've got that good foundation of skill, skill sets to work with those various pieces? So, you know, as said very much earlier on, I, the cloud wasn't there when I started my, my career going through. So as I've adapted, I've kind of the, the projects, the tools, the clients that I've been working with, it's kind of given me some experiences to give me what, okay, what's, what's a Martin shape fit for what type of things can I do? That's taken me a while to establish what is the Martin shape fit for what I'm looking at there. Again, for yourselves, if you're starting out early in the career, what is your specific shape fit? And let's say within this bit, you need to go along with the um, machine learning. It's not an exclusion. It's easily you can be working with, but it's a lot more about the infrastructure and the bits to support it. So the business keeps working. You don't like it when uh, Netflix goes down. So let's make sure Netflix doesn't go down. So how do we do that bit? Well, if we've got all the right behavior and the, the infrastructure behaving properly with all the right um, pieces behind the scenes, it stays up. You can put more content into there. Without that bit, you can't show anything. Same with machine learning. We don't have the right pieces in place to support the company going in there and all the right pieces, the security, the logging and elements behind the scenes of that bit. There's not a guarantee it's going to work. So you kind of want to get your, your it's a very important role to make sure that all the various bits are working properly. Thank you. Thank you for explaining that, Martin. And then we've got another question that just says, what kind of decisions will you be making as a cloud engineer? I think I can I can take a top level example, and then I'd be interested in John kind of uh, answering that question. Um, but I, I think one of the key decisions and where cloud engineers are critically important is imagine if your website or mobile app or uh, kind of digital service does go down. All of a sudden, the most important person in your business is a cloud engineer who has the right monitoring, understands the scalability challenges, why it's not scaling appropriately or why it might not be um, uh, switching over to a disaster recovery environment. So. You know, one of the most important decisions is how do we get this service, digital service, back up and running as quickly and effectively um, as we can. That would be a top level decision. And, you know, as I say, in that instance, as a CTO, having been there before, uh, the, the cloud engineer responsible for that service is my Im most important colleague in the entire business uh, for that period of time. Um, but, John, just some others, uh, you know, uh, as as your place uh, with a client, what kind of key decisions would you say are made within the cloud? Yeah, engine? so I, I think I completely agree with you. Um, scaling and um, uh, reliability, um, absolutely critical. Um, I think reliability comes first. Um, if your website's down, you don't have anything else. Uh, there's no, that you can't deal with like adding bells and whistles if, if, if it doesn't exist. Um, but then also I'd, I'd probably add like, um, you get a lot of choice on technologies that you want to use. So uh, let's say you want to um, hook up the, the internet connection between a couple of applications. You, you can kind of choose what, what kind of services you want to use around that. Um, I think um, because it isn't, um, because it is back end, uh, you get a lot more uh, leeway to make decisions around things, uh, areas. Um, whereas I think if you're a front end, you get a lot more pushback. Uh, from senior people within the company. Um, I think a lot of it's like, if it works, then everyone's happy. Um, so you kind of get to, you, you get to make a lot of decisions um, on your own about how, how you want to set up um, a lot of the connections between uh, the microservices. Um, I think we mentioned microservices recently. Um, it's, uh, it's the idea of your, your application not being one massive application, it being lots of different um, small applications but yeah yeah i think i think there's you get a lot of leeway in making decisions 
Thanks for that, Richard and John. And then we've got a question from Angelica. So I'll just allow you to speak now. There you go, if you'd like to ask a question. Ask a question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so I was just curious. Um, so Richard had emphasized um, cloud engineering is um, for making services more resilient and faster and more secure. And obviously things like Netflix, Instagram, YouTube, I mean, Facebook is relatively old, let's say, but let's fix on, for example, Netflix and Instagram, they're relatively novel. novel. And now we're at like the exponential phase of the growth of the services associated with these businesses. Um, but I was just saying with all trends, there's usually an exponential phase and then like a slower phase than the, the plateau phase. And then I thought that I was just curious to ask basically like if these services like Instagram and Netflix, because it's such a high demand, at some point, surely it's going to reach a plateau phase. And I was just wondering what kind of impact that would have on cloud engineers. Um, yeah, that was basically my question. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, um, I think a bit of feedback on this. Feedback on. I know. There we go. Um, great question. Uh, yeah, I think everyone kind of uh, predicts certain kind of tail offs of uh, certain capabilities, but I, I would challenge um, that cloud engineering is one of those. I think we've demonstrated that um, the, di the level of digital transformation across all businesses globally. Um, is not predicted to die down anytime soon. So yeah, we may see some decline in, uh, let's say, subscribers to Netflix or, or otherwise. And, uh, you know, what that means, therefore, is Netflix are going after a different uh, digital business model and introducing advertising. And that requires a whole load of, you know, at speed to market um, software and data engineering uh, that requires more cloud engineering and less. So all of the existing incumbents are still trying to adapt and evolve at pace at the point that they need to. And every single uh, month, it seems, there are new entries, uh, various startups. They're all, like John said, all of the startups are in the cloud from the start. Uh, and thirdly, there's still a, you know, a huge amount of um, uh, older and perhaps legacy businesses who are migrating uh, faster to the, to the cloud. So. Um, I think businesses will continue to innovate, transform. You know, I think it's likely to warrant more um, engineering needs rather than less, and that engineering will uh, change over time and adapt to um, big businesses or new business needs, um, as well as, uh, you know, we can talk about more longer term uh, disruptive Web3 models. All, all of these uh, disciplines will require cloud engineering, and I, I don't see any tail off uh, for many, many years. If uh, Martin and I think back to uh, pre-cloud, that, that model, 80% uh, uh, of the requirement there is the same as in cloud engineering. It's just not in a uh, scalable uh, cloud uh, data center that's managed uh, by Amazon. It's, um, you know, they were in server rooms that we had to employ people and ask people to put together uh, ourselves and that had a certain limit so the need for this type of engineering capability to drive software um, uh, deployment and resilience hasn't uh, reduced it's only increased over the last 20 years i i predict the same and it's all going to be in the cloud whereas over the past 20 years a large uh, majority of that was um, not not so much in the cloud and, and certainly uh, you know, going back back years in huge mainframes and uh, all of that sort of jazz. So that, that's my view. Um, it will continue to grow. Thank you. There you go. Thank you for that, um, explaining that, Richard. And then lastly, I can see one more question that we've got it's just after the training. What kind of businesses um, can you go into? I think there's, um, well, uh, you know, I, I think our recruitment team can tell you all about our um, cl existing client base. We work with huge global blue chip clients um, and there are huge opportunities there. But in, in terms of cloud engineering in general, I don't know of a business who's not 
transforming and investing heavily in both data and digital uh, kind of mechanisms to interact with their customers and their partners. Um, uh, it, it's, you know, I, I think the the demand is driven by uh, economic uncertainty in some sectors versus others. But if you've got the money as a business and you're growing, you're going to invest a, a whole load of that money in digital transformation um, over uh, the coming decades. So, uh, you know, as, as a market as a whole, every business needs this capability, uh, needs it in abundance. Uh, and uh, Kubrick specifically gives you access to some fantastic uh, uh, global clients um, and, you know, being able to work in uh, teams alongside other uh, Kubrick consultants, uh, both in training and uh, when you're placed. Thank you for that, Richard. And then I've got Omar who would like to ask a question. So I'll just allow you to speak now. Um, I just have a quick question. In terms of like the training programs, if you enter a particular stream, would you be able to... Um, like how flexible is it in terms of switching from one to the other? Like if you start on a data engineering stream and you complete it or throughout it, you feel like maybe you are more into cloud engineering, would you be able to switch or is it pretty fixed in terms of if you enter a stream, you kind of have to stay in it for two years? Great question, Omar. Uh, now, obviously, I think we the training syllabus that Martin has put together, whilst there's some overlap with some of our other uh, kind of practice areas and specialisms, there's very much some some of that content and training uh, and capability that's specific uh, to that practice area. Um, and obviously, the you know at the end of that training, we are um, placing uh, our consultants with um, clients that are hoping to build uh, their cloud engineering capability. Um, so generally speaking, that is the intention uh, in terms of sticking with the practice because that's the uh, the best way of accelerating your career in such a high demand uh, discipline. Um, obviously, if there are you know certain challenges or findings on the way, then we, we will have those conversations with you and uh, and, and you know uh, adapt as uh, we we both see fit. Um, but I guess the intention going into it is is to stick within the discipline. Um, you will learn other traits. So, it's, you know, certainly in cloud engineering, you will learn a bit about data engineering, as we've heard, a bit about machine learning engineering, a bit about all sorts of um, kind of logical problem solving. So it is transferable uh, as a whole, but um, the intention would be to stay within the practice and give it a shot on site uh, as a consultant um, to leverage your skills. And then we've got another question here. Um, Tendai, so I'll allow you to speak now. Hi, guys. Uh, I just wanted to ask, so in terms of, the qualification backgrounds. Um, are you guys open to people that have done a conversion into computer science um, for one year only um, as a master's? Or you know, is that something not on the cards for you guys? Because I, I understand there might be some overlap with you know Python and learning the fundamentals. I know that uh, we've taken people who've got, you know, their degrees, all of your degrees are varied. Uh, and the backgrounds in there. Some will have a computer science components within there, some won't. We're not making it a mandatory that you've got computer science as uh, the only way to be working in cloud engineering. So um, if it's part of the skill set and it's fitting into the bits, that's useful, but we also wanna make sure that we're giving you the learning experience. So if you're going, well, actually I've done all bits of Python, I'm an absolute Python guru and all my stuff is currently on Stack Overflow and GitHub then maybe the learning experience doesn't necessarily fit with you for that particular role going through. But actually we're also trying to make sure we're applying it to different problems and different areas. So even when we're taking people within the current cohort who've got different experiences of, of using languages, we're extending what they've, what they've done previously. We're giving them different scenarios and we're taking it to another level above and beyond what they were doing before. So it's not a mandatory requirement, we also don't want to make sure that you're bored for the various bits. We want to make sure it's a learning experience going through. There you go. And then we've got one more before we'll have to wrap up. Um, Angelica. Hello again. Um, I just had a question for Richard and Martin. Um, I was just really curious to um, hear about this. So, um, for example, with the development of things like Fitbit and like you know, um, there's an increasing demand for data. For example, with Fitbit, measures like your heart rate, your sleeping pattern, your REM sleep and all of that stuff. And I was just curious to know what 
Richard and Martin's experience like with this increasing demand of how to process data in in comparison to before, if that makes sense? Was it like overwhelming? Um, was it like exciting for you guys? Like, I just wanted to, yeah, kind of know what it was like to kind of go through this transition. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll give a quick answer and definitely interested in Martin's answer as well. Yeah, I, I've been a data geek for all of my career. Um, and, uh, you know, it started with uh, some top level kind of customer data matched to product data. But now the uh, amount of uh, different data sets that tell you different uh, things. And, you know, I use apps all the time, off uh, my watch or my phone uh, to track uh, health statistics and um, even uh, you know, how many calories I'm eating and all of that sort of stuff. So I'm kind of always interested in, in the data side of it. And yeah, under the hood, the scalability of the cloud has made that huge data set uh, much more able to be uh, kind of leveraged, uh, consumed, brought together, aggregated. Machine learning on top of that has uh, helped us predict based on um, learning and training models automatically. Uh, based on a, you know those huge data sets. So I think it's a, a fascinating area. I think all businesses are wanting more. Um, so I've really enjoyed it. I'm not sure I've answered your question particularly well, but that, I've, I've really enjoyed it and you know massively interested. Martin, sorry, I've blabbered That's on a bit. For me, it, it's probably like it's all of a sudden you're in the sweet shop. There's all of a sudden all these new data sets that are available. Um, in fact, data itself is becoming its own commodity because you can then lease out uh, access to these particular data sets so you know um, things you hadn't thought about you could connect in together the interconnectivity of different systems is astounding you know um, 10 15 years ago the notion of telling your house to go and switch the lights on um, was something with science fiction and now we're just used to going to telling the very you know, most of the devices in our house to do various bits when we come in all the technology all the data behind the scenes of that is, is fantastic to see how it's being available we can use um, it's opened up all kinds of possibilities that weren't there before. The journey of the companies as they are in the cloud at the moment is there's now more systems that can give you other ways of analyzing or processing your data. You can start to get the machine learning of um, your customer base. You're getting all of the analytics coming through to go and say, yep, there's two trees and a car in that photo, which is giving you that data out of things which was previously just a static image. So the data sets are sort of, um, growing. There's, it's all about the innovation and the interconnectivity of those different systems to give you the right bits you want to be having. Otherwise, you could get lost in all the quantity of data. But yeah, my goodness, there's a whole lot more now than there used to be. And the possibilities are increasing probably daily, if not hourly, if we know what these cloud providers are kicking out. Thank you so much. Yeah, I was just curious because if, or hopefully, when I become one, um, it'd be really exciting to kind of experience that transition as well, because obviously there's going to be something more to happen. And yeah, that's really cool. Thank you so much. No worries. There you go. Well, I think that's all we have time for um, today. But um, we popped in the group the link to apply for anyone that's interested. Um, but I'd just like to say um, a massive thank you for you all attending today. And obviously our wonderful panelists as well for taking the time to speak. Um, and the webinar will be recorded and it will be shared with you all post-webinar. But thank you again for all attending. <laughs>